Hello and welcome to Ticket Manager's All Access Interview Series, engaging leaders from across the sports marketing spectrum to identify and explore critical issues in the business of sports, entertainment, sponsorship, activation, ticketing, hospitality, and even more. I'm your host, Jim Andrews. Joining me on this episode to discuss what it takes to run and grow a successful sports organization is Peter Fagan, president of the reigning NBA champion, Milwaukee Bucks. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. As I just mentioned, you know, on, on the court, the, the team is just about to begin its defense of the championship. And that's, of course, a, a big challenge for the players. On the business side, you know, you have a, an entire season now to continue to leverage being the champs. So, you know, I, I really appreciate if you could describe kind of the, you know, the tangible as maybe some of the intangible benefits of, of being number one and, and how you're taking advantage of that. Yeah, well, I think instantaneously you win an NBA championship and you've kind of been on this global platform throughout the NBA playoffs and the finals. And you have this unbelievable opportunity to really leverage what that audience looks like and and how to monetize it in a big way. So there's no there's no time to rest, unfortunately. You'd love you'd love some time to sit and 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 rest on your laurels and really enjoy it. But the truth is you have a window where your global audience is larger than it ever has, your awareness is high, you're selling retail like you've never sold retail before, you've got a real, you know, you, you've got a real high equity price for everything from your tickets to your sponsorship to people globally understanding what the Deer District is. So it's this moment in time where you really have to think about what are the priorities and how do we leverage that for our growth in the future. One of the things that uh, you and I talked a little bit earlier uh, that I hadn't given a lot of thought of until you mentioned it was, you know, industries across the country are facing uh, a labor shortage. And that, you know, was something that I think most of us didn't anticipate being this severe or, or lasting this long now that we're, you know, well into the fall. How are you managing that issue for a business that, you know, really prioritizes customer service and, and the fan experience? Yeah, I think it's our transformational event that nobody's talking about, about this period in history, like which will really change. We had the pandemic and we had to figure out how to operate around that, kind of accelerated what mobile app use was, what what ticketing, what safety and, uh, and, and protocols were to really kind of tend to it. Now, all of a sudden, we're, you know, kind of in that same period of time learning to do what we do with with half 60 70 percent of the labor force so what's that forcing us to do is rethink the way we service an audience the way food and beverage is served the way ticketing is happening not because i mean we're literally forced to do it and i think like what you're going to see is a lot of these operations in the sports entertainment business coming out of this in the next six to 12 months being able to efficiently run with with a fraction of the labor force. And, and that's kind of the paradigm that will shift. And that's everything from how do you think of security on a surveillance level to how do you think of your, your, your mobile ability to communicate in a real time to how do you reposition your guest services people, you know, to, to have that qualitative touch. So there's so many touch points, but the reality is the labor force has diminished so much. There's no... There's nothing in sight for this to change. So we've had to react to it in a very big way. And I think it's going to change the way we do business fundamentally for the future. I would imagine some of the kind of the, the automation that, that has come about in, in recent years and it was accelerated during the pandemic probably helps with that situation. But you know, there's still there's still a human element to customer service, right? So I, I'm just wondering, what do you, what do you think the biggest impact might be, or, or maybe the biggest change that you expect to see this season because of that uh, situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think you know, I think on the qualitative side, it's the human touch. You know, how do we how do we physically service our customers, whether that's our ticket retention people, you know, and our premium people for season tickets. Or like, how do we transact? You know, what's what's your bar experience like? You know, for for transactions and what does that mean for for volume? What does it mean for per caps? I mean, so far the trends are the trends are positive, but but there'll be a significant paradigm shift in the way people are serviced and the way people transact and and depending a lot more on automation, on on renewals and and new acquisitions 
for things like ticket sales. So it, it's going to happen quickly. You mentioned the Deer District and, uh, you know, certainly can't have a conversation with you without talking about that. I mean, the overwhelming success that we all witnessed during the, the NBA playoffs and, and the finals uh, earlier this year, yeah, I think it's safe to say exceeded everyone's expectations. I'm wondering, has the the way that the fan base really embraced uh, the, the Deer District, has that changed the way you now are thinking about kind of future developments and programming and, and things like that? Yeah, it's allowed us to do two things. First of all, the awareness and, and the coverage and the platform, like through the NBA playoffs and the NBA finals, has, has catapulted like where we are on a brand recognition. I mean, we you know, have traveled a bunch, you know, since the finals and, and people are referring to the Deer District, you know, as a locator for, for, for things, which is fantastic. You know, when you can aggregate 60,000 people, you know, in a controlled, great, you know, uh, event and, and start to do it, it's made us, so it's done that immediately. And then what it's really made us do is pivot and rethink what our general plan design is, you know, for the future building blocks of the district itself. Like we have certainly kind of qualified the fact that this is an outdoor venue that can populate, that can activate, that can curate kind of events. What does that mean for the way we now want to structure it? Maybe a little more outdoor space than we had thought, maybe a, a little more um, entertainment-esque type of things as we build more. But I think, number one, it's allowed us to be this, the focal point as we get out of the pandemic, which really stunted our development growth like everybody else in the world. And we've been able to hit the restart building very, very quickly. We've, we've started, we broke ground on a hotel um, two weeks ago, which is fantastic. And it's our hope that the 18 month you know, pandemic stop will, will, will suit us. We'll, we'll very quickly be restarted in the form of more residential, more commercial, and kind of, as we've talked about in the past, like the, the thought of this district being a neighborhood where people live, where people work, and where people play. So it's a destination, but it's also a, a very viable 24-7, 365 neighborhood. Well, and that leads me to, to ask, I mean, we're really talking about a, a paradigm shift when you talk about the organization and looking at where growth is coming from. And, and, and I'm wondering, is, is that really kind of the, the future of, of sports organizations? And now it almost seems limiting to call an organization like the Bucks a sports organization because there's so much else going on in terms of, you know, you're a real estate developer and an entertainment programmer now and, and all of that kind of thing. Is that really the, the future as, as opposed to just, you know, kind of trying to generate more revenue from those core sports assets, the team, the arena, media rights, tickets, and all and merchandise, all of, all of that kind of stuff. Is, is the yeah. future really in all of this, these new territories? Without a question. I mean, I think when you're so close to this business, you realize traditional revenue triggers don't have much growth opportunity. There's only so much you can raise ticket prices. There's only so much, you know, inventory and, and leveraging traditional sponsorship. You know, you've got to think of, you, you're not going to grow selling tickets and hot dogs, you know, as I'm reminded by our owners, you know, very quickly. But what is the opportunity? You know, you build infrastructures that are billions of dollars in arenas and stadiums. How do you activate those, you know, beyond your core business of an NBA team or, you know, a major league baseball team, I think. And then how do you build kind of the, the monetization model around it to, to, to really think about, you've got your, your centerpiece of an arena or stadium, and then how do you aggregate, you know, all of the other pieces to monetize um, around that? And that's kind of the idea of a district. And, and we've seen great examples when we were planning, you know, this district, whether it was Columbus, Ohio, whether it was, you know, Kansas City, whether it was, you know, the Staples Center and LA Live, you know, these are all great examples of how do you leverage the mothership, you know, in the arena to really create viable businesses around it. Yeah, as, a, as an old sponsorship guy myself, I look at something like the Deer District and see see an opportunity, you know, for maybe a naming rights partner. And you know, you've got you've got a great arena, you've got a great partner in, in Fiserv. Have you had any conversations or, or, you know, internally or externally about, gee, is that, is that something you would look to do? Or maybe you want to keep that, you know, now you've got an established brand in the Deer District. Maybe you don't want to introduce another name in there. Well, as you know, there's always a solution to sell. 
So, so whether it's the entitlement of the plaza, whether it's air rights, whether it's, you know, and for us, we're, you know, we've got our, our sales hats on, on monetizing all physical assets on really figuring out what makes sense. So absolutely, you know, we'd love to find, we, we do think there is a tremendous amount of value and now it's quantified, you know, on a global scale to get done. So we think that's an unbelievable opportunity to kind of rethink what naming rights means off the building in a big way. So yeah, I think, you know, we are definitely in market to, to sell, you know, entitlements all over the district uh, in a big way. You've mentioned a couple of times the, the kind of the new global appeal, right? And the fact that, you know, the, the Bucks are now now known in, in many, many other countries. And obviously that has an impact you know, directly on, on your brand and your business, but you've also really become kind of the, the face of, of the city of Milwaukee to a, to a lot of people. I'm curious if that leads to an increased interaction with your, your local government folks up there, the tourism leaders. Are you taking on perhaps more of an official role in the efforts to, uh, to promote you know, visitors to, to Milwaukee and the surrounding area? Yeah, I would say we've, you know, down from our owners been given the edict to engage, you know, and we want to be community leaders, we want to be community innovators. We think if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And part of growth is how do we how do we have a call to action to the city of Milwaukee, whether it's via tourism, how do we help recruit businesses? to come here. So we are involved in all these tentacles, you would imagine, to promote the city and the growth, because we think, you know, at the end of the day, that 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 helps us, you know, rising tides, you know, helps, floats all the, so like, how do we, how do we move that? And we've got this unbelievable, you know, I'd say almost disproportionate influence, being NBA champions, being such large developers in what it really is like a, you know, a small city you know, and, and, and demographic area. So, you know, for us, it's a big opportunity to affect change. Part of that leadership role uh, that, that you spoke of, you know, the organization and you personally have become, you know, very well known for being leaders and taking a stand on, on social justice issues. And the movement was, you know, such a focus during all of the different events of, of 2020 I'm wondering now, how do you keep the momentum going in what I would say is, you know, less obviously turbulent times is maybe the best way I can put it. But it, yeah, how do you keep that conversation alive? We think it's the same kind of philosophy and culture we have, whether in our business or basketball or social justice. I mean, it's constant improvement. So we look at what we've done. How can we do it better? How, how can we create some consistency and some sustainability in what we stand for? in a very big way. I mean, we think like at the end of the day, at 30,000 feet, we stand for equality and fairness, you know, and what does that mean? And we have like a significant platform that that we've chosen to, to use to, to get that done. So, you know, we think there's still a, a big mountain to climb and, uh, and, you know, there will always be opportunities to, to kind of speak up for equality and fairness. Peter, before I let you go, I wanted to ask, you know, we have a lot of uh, folks in various different roles, but, you know, primarily in the sports and, and entertainment industry, whether on the property side, the, the brand side, the agency side. In looking at, at, at your history, you know, one of the things that you did was kind of left the sports world for a little while, went into the corporate world and then came back. Uh, so I'd love to just hear a little bit about what maybe you, you learned in kind of leaving this, this corner of the world and, and, and then coming back to it, what, what you may have brought back from, from your experience. Yeah, I think the biggest lesson learned is, is, is kind of management, accountability, you know, kind of work effort, you know, is the same no matter what your subject matter is, you know, so whether it's private aviation or theme parks in my, you know, in my world, kind of the, the, the true tenets of, of kind of success always were the same. And then I think I had the distinct advantage. You know, I, I say one of the things I do professionally and everybody should do is collect people. Like how do you surround yourself and not only surround yourself, but build a consultancy around yourself, you know, throughout your life that that's great. And if you have a diverse background, it only deepens kind of that network in a big way. So I think I've got a distinct advantage in kind of understanding some things outside the sports and business, you know, the sports entertainment business, which helps you think differently, 
about it you know helps helps do it i mean some of the greatest things about our industry is it's 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 very legacy driven people once they're in never want to leave for obvious reasons but it 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 hurts us in a diversity of thought you know and innovation sometimes so you know i think i didn't know it while i was doing it but but i do really think it helped my career growth path and and really thinking to have done things in other industries and understand best practices and and lessons learned in a big way. And, and I kind of give people that advice of there's very few things that aren't that you're unable to leverage for growth, you know, as long as you continue to learn, as long as you consider to have an opportunity. So I, I think I was extremely lucky. I wish I was smart enough to know it at the time, but looking <laughs> back, like it's great. Well, I think that that's that's great advice. And uh... Uh, again, really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and, and hitting some of the, the highlights in our business right now and, and uh, wish you uh, all the success uh, this, this season and, and as we head into 2022 and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to, to talk again. Great. Go Bucks. <laughs> thanks, Peter. On behalf of everyone at Ticket Manager, thank all of you for watching and listening. And please join us again for the next episode in the All Access interview series.